so excited to have Wendy here from Austin. Um, I think most of you know her. Um, for her. She has fought tirelessly, uh, first as a Texas state senator, and then um, in her run for governor uh, for women's reproductive rights, uh, gender uh, equal pay, LGBTQ rights, uh, justice for sexual assault uh, survivors, um, just has an incredible track record. Um, and I think you probably also know her for a somewhat historic 13-hour filibuster and some pink sneakers. Um, um, and most recently, she has started an advocacy group called Deeds Not Words, which we're going to talk about today, um, that is all about channeling um, the energy and passion for uh, gender equality into actionable change. So. Hi, Jess. Welcome, Wendy. Hello, everyone. So why don't we start with Deeds Not Words, okay. and um, tell us a little bit about it and why you founded it. I started Deeds Not Words. It's a nonprofit organization about a year ago, really starting from the perspective of wanting to make sure that we were giving the best opportunity for that next generation of young women who are going to be the filibusterers of the future to find their way to that path. Um, I travel and speak a lot, and I was frequently asked a question that I'm still asked a lot, which is, what do we do, right? And, and you see this incredible knowledge and passion, but sometimes a struggle about where to connect that to action. And so Deeds Not Words was born really with two big ideas in mind. One is to make sure that we're putting together in one place an area that you can go to, a hub, our digital hub, and you can find a variety of different organizations and the work that they're doing in the gender equality world. And it's separated by health, so things that are happening in the reproductive rights world, for example, safety, which of course includes campus sexual assault, human trafficking, and sexual assault criminal justice reform work. Um, economic opportunity, which includes a lot of organizations that are working on equality of pay, on affordable quality child care, on increasing the minimum wage, on family leave policies, all of those things that make such an important difference in our ability to equalize our economic opportunity in this country. And then leadership. Uh, there are so many different organizations. You have one based right here in California, Emerge that are really there for women to make sure that where we have women who are thinking about stepping forward and running for office, they have the support around them and the system that helps them to raise money and to have the resources and the knowledge that they need to do that and, and to do it well. So that's what we do in the digital space. We have a weekly digital newsletter called the Deeds Digest. And in that newsletter, we inform, we try to inspire, I hope we do sometimes, and we end each Deeds Digest with the do's of the week, and those do's always tie into the things that we talked about in that particular newsletter. And then we do a daily deed. We started doing that just a few weeks ago, um, post Women's March, trying to make sure that where people were looking for a way to plug in and some direction and guidance in that regard, we do that. That's all the, the digital part of what we do. The other piece of it, and certainly this is how I found my way into the political world, is helping us to find our power as advocates. It can be kind of hard to navigate your way into that and to know exactly how to do it. I think that Indivisible has been such an important resource in helping people to see how we can use our voices in a very, very powerful way. And I love the structure and the guidance that they've put together for that. We are doing tactical trainings of advocacy work. So it, we started in Texas. We have our eye on several other states that we want to expand into. But we're working with both high school and college age young women. And we're helping to um, foster their voices into the legislative process. So they're working on two key issues right now with a number of legislators, kind of from idea to how you write a piece of legislation to coming to committee hearings and testifying for it and how you present yourself and how to make a most effective argument. And the areas that we're really focusing on in that work are sex trafficking of minors and also sexual assault 
reforms in both the criminal justice world, rape kit backlog, for example, statute of limitations issues, but also campus sexual assault and kind of changing the landscape of what our understanding is about consent, um, how we define that, how we define um, yes rather than no means no. What, what does it mean to say yes? Um, so we're focused on, on those things. And we find that our young audience is very interested and passionate about those particular issues. And so it's been a really good way to foster their advocacy skills. What's been the most surprising thing that you've discovered since starting? I guess just the, the challenge of taking an idea. I, I can do the political thing pretty well. I know how to navigate my way in that world. And that's a learning curve, too, just like anything. But it's a learning curve for me right now, how to take these ideas and most effectively implement them, and just how hard it is to be a startup. Um, a startup nonprofit is no different, really, than a startup profit, other than you obviously don't need to make money. You need people to donate money to you. The VCs are maybe um, a little less excited about the nonprofit startup, right? <laughs> I guess right? that's so true, yeah. Um, but I think most surprising is just how um, eager people are to, to be connected in ways that, that make them feel like their voices really make a difference. And they do make a difference. They truly do. And, what, and so it sounds like from everything you're talking about that to you the, the biggest way to affect political, to change kind of the current political landscape would be to get more women out there No involved. question. Um, what, what else? Like what else? If, if, obviously, you need to have your focus on, 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 on say, advocacy. What other areas do you think could be making a difference right now? I'm sure there are a lot of people in this room and on the live stream that want to know how they could get more involved. What do you think is the most effective? You and I had a great conversation a moment ago before we came up here, and I, I thought you actually characterized and crystallized this perfectly. What you were saying was that we have to pick those two or three things that we are really going to care about and dive into and try to avoid the temptation, because there's so much going on right now, um, to weigh in in every little space. So whatever that area of passion is for you, whether it's the environment or LGBTQ equality or transgender rights in, in specific or women's equality and all of the different uh, realms of that, find the place that really connects to you or that you connect to. Because what you'll find, I've certainly always found this in my life, if you follow the thing that you really care about and you use your energy on that thing, it's going to take you to a place that you wouldn't have expected and it's going to be unbelievably fulfilling, both personally but also with your ability to actually have an impact on it because it's coming from a place that's really true to you. So whatever that is, look for organizations that are working in that world. You know, if it's voting rights, you know, ACLU, um, if it's uh, women's reproductive freedoms, obviously you know the incredible organizational work of groups like Planned Parenthood and NARAL, but maybe you don't know so much about the Center for Reproductive Rights, which is doing all the legal work on this. And actually, were the, the major impetus behind the successful Supreme Court case that we won last year. Um, maybe you care particularly about making sure that women have access to safe and legal abortion. And you want to really get into the ground level of that and support organizations like the Lilith Fund, which makes sure that women can afford to have an abortion if they otherwise don't have the financial means to do that. So there's so many different ways to plug in. And what we hope to do with our website, and we're actually in a revamp of it right now to make it much more meaningful if you're looking for that place to plug in. Um, we want to be a place where you can go, and depending on that area of interest, you plug into one of those organizations, and you will find immediately two or three key ways that they're asking for you to get involved on a real-time basis, some more intense and some less intense, but ways where you can meaningfully be contributing your time and your energy. And what about companies? What role do you think companies should or shouldn't have? Have you seen their advocacy be effective? 
I think their advocacy is tremendously effective. Um, I'm sensitive, obviously, to the fact that companies walk uh, uh, quite a fine line in terms of not wanting to get involved so much in the partisan world. And that makes sense because they have consumers who sit on both sides of that line. They have, I'm sure, employees that sit on both sides of that line. But I think we find our way into the things that make sense when we are being very issue focused. And so, for example, last year in my home state of Texas, uh, American Airlines became the title sponsor of the Planned Parenthood luncheon in Dallas for the very first time. I almost cried. I literally, I was so blown away by it because it made such a powerful statement for a company like that to say, we support women's reproductive health care and this organization. And in the face of all the political flack that Planned Parenthood is in the midst of, we're going to step forward and we're going to do this. So I think you know, for companies to find their way into issue areas that really matter to them and to use their influence, uh, and there are many ways for them to do that, of course. We certainly saw the incredible impact in North Carolina last year with the transgender bathroom bill. Texas, by the way, is trying to replicate that right now. And I'm pleased to see we've got some corporate pushback already beginning to percolate. But that corporate pushback in North Carolina not only contributed to really um, an economic impact to the state, but it made such a powerful statement economically that it impacted the way voters thought about that issue so that in the last gubernatorial race that they had during the, the presidential election cycle, they elected a statewide Democrat. Um, that was considered a really long shot thing to do there, actually. And they did it because people now were coming at this issue from a variety of perspectives, whether it was something that they cared about from their social conscience or whether they cared about it because they understand, understood it was having an impact economically to their state and maybe to their own pocketbook. Uh, that's what companies have the power to do and to, to broaden the conversation in a way that really does lift it up out of the social and makes it something that's much more meaningful in the day-to-day -day lives of people who have respect for or who are impacted by the decisions and the actions that that company takes. So where do you think companies are still being silent? Like, well, on what issue do you wish companies were speaking out more about? Well, when I looked at what happened in North Carolina um, with appreciation and awe for the companies that stepped forward so powerfully on that and objected to it, I found myself longing for that same response in other areas. Um, I, of course, am very focused on gender equality. And I wish we saw more of that when it came to issues that particularly impact women. In Texas, when we passed that anti-abortion bill in 2013, that was in and of itself terrible. But what happened actually two years prior to that, that a lot of people didn't know about, there was no big filibuster, it didn't capture the attention of people around the world. In 2011, in an assault on Planned Parenthood, there was a dramatic defunding of women's health care there. And they couldn't really deselect just Planned Parenthood. Um, and so what happened was that there was this wholesale withdrawal of funds. Number one, the state decided to no longer participate in the women's health program, which was giving us about $30 million a year for women's reproductive health care. It's aimed particularly at lowering the Medicaid birth rate and saving taxpayer money by virtue of doing it. And it really was saving a tremendous amount of taxpayer money. Um, we departicipated in that. And that affected not just Planned Parenthood, but everyone that was getting money for birth control, reproductive health care services in our state. And then there was also a $78 million state defunding of these women's reproductive health care centers. None of these were providing abortion care, not a single one. And overnight, we had over 80 clinics close all over our state. 
those that still remained open were hobbled really badly and could only see a, a small percentage of the patients that they'd been seeing. And there's a wide range of estimates about the number of women who were impacted, but it's anywhere from 100 to 180,000 women in one fell swoop. And we see the circumstances of that in our state. We have the highest maternal death rate of any developed country in the world, in the state of Texas. Our maternal death rate doubled in about a six year period of time. So these are dramatic, horrific human consequences that women are getting sucked into by virtue of partisan politics. And I wanna see companies step forward and say, when these sorts of things are happening, you know, we were gonna relocate our corporate headquarters to Dallas, Texas, and now we've decided not to. Or we're the NCAA and we were gonna host the Final Four there and now we've decided not to. Or we're the Super Bowl and we were coming but now we're not going to. I wanna see that kind of response when women are under assault. Because it's not just that we are failing to realize our full equal opportunity, it's that we literally are the shrapnel um, in these political wars where human lives are being impacted in devastating ways. And it's something that we all ought to care about because at the end of the day, it impacts everyone. And at the end of the day, it impacts our economy as well. So how do you do it? How do you get women, and so this obviously disproportionately, dramatically affects the poor, right? It does. And then you have uh, wealthier women who are at companies, who are at these companies. Mm -hmm. How do you get them to stand up in the same way that people have stood up for other right, like rights for other groups that they don't necessarily belong to? I think part of it starts within the culture of the organization, the company itself, right? And what does the, what does the makeup of that company look like in terms of the number of women on its board, the number of women that are in the executive suites of that company? That has a lot of influence in these conversations. Um, and so continuing for gender equality in the positions that women occupy is a very important part of that, just as is the case for making sure that we have women fully reflected at every level of representative government in this country. And less than until we have that, we're not gonna move this conversation really where it needs to go. But we have an opportunity as employees and as consumers to, to exert our own influences. Uh, we've been talking about that a bit at Deeds Not Words. When I first was hatching this idea, one of the things I wanted us ultimately to be able to do is to weigh in as consumers and to help direct consumer decision making based on a company's score with how well it's doing to support gender equality. Is this a company where there are um, a, a representative number of women in the executive suites and on the board? Is this a company that's like Salesforce done a self-examination of pay equity and worked hard to make sure they were equalizing it? Is it a company that has a good uh, family leave policy, both for dads and moms, so that we do have true gender equality in the way that that's happening? And helping to drive people's positive buying decisions based on companies that score well in that regard. Right now, I'm sure you've all seen Grab Your Wallet. And Grab Your Wallet is doing, uh, I, I think, an interesting job of making sure that they're making people aware of how to take their dollars away as consumers from companies who aren't behaving well. I have found myself responding to that. Um, and, and thinking about which rideshare company I'm gonna use, for example, or um, which retail establishment, not Macy's, that I'm gonna shop at. Um, I have my own experience with Macy's because they actually advocated against an equal pay law in Texas and were successful in getting the governor to veto an equal pay law that I worked very, very hard on. So if any of you are shopping at Macy's, I'm just gonna add my two cents to what's already on the grab your wallet site um, when it comes to that particular company. But we, we have influences in that regard. And I think we're starting to see some of the response that uh, private 
companies are making to watching the way consumers are responding. This young woman that we were talking about earlier who just recently left Uber and who you know, told, shared her story, essentially, for the outside world and the immediate impact that that's had. Uh, while she worked within that culture for a very long time, trying to change it, bringing outside attention on it, and having the, the executive offices have to deal with the, the public opinion of their company based on that, that experience, I think it, it has shown we have a lot of power if we can really kind of focus that Yeah, I think it'll be interesting to see glass. is that gets easier, right? Right now it's very yeah. almost, it's an entirely almost offline or an individual experience where yes, Kate, you mm-hmm. can post on social that you've done boycotted something or supported right. something. But it'll be interesting to see how that evolves as that I think the tech solutions get easier for mm-hmm. the company, like you said, the companies that are doing the things that align with your values and mm-hmm. how that gets surfaced. So how did you get into politics? And what was the moment where you were just like, oh, wow, I'm a big deal? <laughs> I haven't. Ha- I promise you, I haven't had that moment. I'm, I'm like. It wasn't so when you had a catheter women. during a filibuster. Where you're <laughs> yeah, I, I know we all do this, but I think women particularly do this. We take in all the things that we're not achieving, as opposed to celebrating the things that we're doing well. Right? We tend to be very self-critical. Um, but my entree into politics and the reason that I was really committed to the advocacy training work of Deeds Not Words happened when I went to a city council meeting. I was in my 30s. I was arguing for something in my neighborhood along with you know, a lot of other people in the neighborhood community. And I walked into that council chamber, expressed my opinion, and then just got the idea, well, I could be one of those people sitting up there. you know. And this is interesting, actually. And I think I would really thrive in this environment. And So it just opened up the idea for me. I had not been paying attention to politics. I was one of those people that I really work on right now. Um, I was a young single mom. I was working two jobs and going to school. And my struggles did not include the, the thought about how my voice could make a difference in the political world. And I, I really didn't set up and pay attention to it until I saw Hillary Clinton fighting for universal health care as first lady. That was kind of my first you know, tug into it, where it, it seemed relevant and meaningful to me, based on my own experiences and struggles with health care as an uninsured person. So we find our ways, again, I think, um, when we are we're helped to demystify that process where we see that those fancy capital buildings, whether we're talking about the one in DC or the ones around our states, those buildings belong to us. There's nothing um, really mysterious or, or intimidating about them. And I think we have to demystify them. And, and I'm pleased to be doing that for some young people in my own state and helping them to see that You know, the people that are elected there, while they may refer to it as my district or my office, the district is actually one that belongs to the people. Their office belongs to us. They have to, at least at some level, listen to us, even if they do avoid us in town halls, which some of them around the country have been doing. But we have the power um, to speak out by calling their offices, writing their offices, coming to committee hearings, and letting them know how we feel about things. And um, I hope that the more people we can encourage into that um, venue, the more young women will see that they have every right to be sitting up at those decision-making tables and that they'll begin to view that as something that they want to do for themselves. And yet I imagine one of the most discouraging things when you're thinking about running for any kind of office or speaking up is that you always know that this is all going to be seen through the lens of your gender. And I remember, I mean, I remember when you were running for governor and there was, like, how many hours a week did you spend with your kids? Right, or it was like how many days uh, in Mm -hmm. in a month when you were did you go back to see your kids, which never ever ever right right, would happen, Um, and and that's got to be something that's quite discouraging. Not only just the public aspect of this all, but knowing that you're going to be you have to fight twice as hard to be taken seriously. How you know 
How did you navigate that? I mean, was it, you know, to a certain degree, you have to play that game, that you can't transcend mm -hmm. it entirely. At the same time, you want to have your control over your narrative. How did you approach that? Or how do you approach it today, too? For me, it's, it's still one of the most frustrating experiences that I've had in the political world. And women face this, you know, every level of profession. One of the things that was successfully done to me during my gubernatorial race, and it was really kind of, I mean, if I stand aside and just look at it as a spectator, I'm rather fascinated by it. Being in the middle of it, it was horrific and painful. Um, but one of the clever things that happens in the political world is trying to figure out how to take a candidate's best asset and make it their weakness. And that's what happened with me. My asset was my story, the American dream story of coming from poverty, struggling, fighting, making my way all the way through Harvard Law School, first person in my family to ever even go to college, never mind graduate, and then to you know have a, a career where I gave back to my own life experiences and the things that I fought for. That, that was my feather, right? That was the thing that I could distinguish myself about. Well, my story got ripped out from under me. I was a bad mother. I um, commuted back and forth from Boston to Fort Worth in my second and third year of law school because that first year taking my girls there with me was not just really hard on me, it was so hard on them. Um, and where a man would never have been questioned about that, my bona fides as a mother was called into question. My two daughters actually had to come forward and uh, they wrote a very heartfelt letter that they read publicly about my bona fides as a mother. Um, you just wouldn't see this happening for men. But I understood why they were doing it. And I also understood with some of the labels that they used with me why they were doing them. Abortion Barbie was a label that was used quite often for me. And in fact, when I came to do some fundraising in Southern California during that race, there were these big posters that had been put up all over LA with, there were 3D posters with uh, Barbie, plastic, transparent uh, belly with a plastic baby doll in the belly and me with scissors in my hand. Um, so why would they do that? Well, a couple of things. Number one, they wanted to make me a candidate that was all about abortion <clears throat> and to take away all, the entire body of work that I had done as a public servant and what I had to offer as a candidate. But they also wanted the Barbie image was very purposeful. If we can invite voters to think about women candidates in terms of how we look, then we dismiss our capacities as leaders. We're inviting people to think about them as mothers and bad mothers at that, um, as women who are no more than the makeup of what we look like and to therefore take away our perspectives about our, our true value as leaders. It happens to women in the political world all the time. I am not unique. Um, it was particularly bad in my race, and it was particularly bad in Hillary's race, but it happens to women all the time. And I think you know, the, the best way to ride through that and to rise above it is to continue to fight back every single time and to pop right back up. That, that was one of the things that I always admired about Hillary. I've never seen anyone that could pop right back up and get back out there and fight another day. And it's unfortunate that we have to do it, but it's the reality. And I think unless and until we have more women in those gubernatorial mansions, um, unless and until we have a woman in the White House, and we can show the incredible capacity that women have to lead in those executive positions, we're gonna to continue to struggle with these stereotypes. So I'm really committed to just doing everything we can to chip away at it in school boards, in city councils, in 
every state legislative um, body in this country and obviously at the congressional and of course the presidential level too. And so you, you lost the race and you know in the valley we love to talk about failure. Mm -hmm. It makes us all stronger and like there's usually a story of how I failed at this and then I, you know, I was bankrupt and I looked up at the stars and realized <laughs> I disrupt the auto industry or something, right? And then you become this like billionaire. Did you have an equivalent moment? I mean, did you take anything from that failure? Most definitely. I, I wrote an essay for Lena Dunham's Lenny letter um, just within a few months of that race. And if it's okay for me to say a curse word, the title of my essay was, I fucking hate to lose. <laughs> um, and, and I talked about just what a competitive person I am by nature. I'm sure a lot of you are as well. Um, but that, you know, going back to that beautiful Teddy Roosevelt um, quote about what it means to be in the ring, to be that person who sweats and tries their hardest and comes up short, but how much more glorious it is to be that person than to be the person who's standing on the sideline as the critic, right? It's only when we put ourselves out there and we risk losing that we will ever move the ball. Um, there's value no matter what in that moving of the ball. I know in the political world that in places like Texas, a lot of times these conversations, these hard conversations that need to be had about policy, they're not being had except for when we have these big statewide contests where we can raise the conversation and the level of consciousness around them. And for me, that was a really important part of running for office. Um, but the same can be said of anything that we are working to do, anything we're striving for that's hard and that we may fail at, every attempt we make at it advances it a little bit. And we ultimately will succeed in those goals, whether it's me individually or not, I will have played a part in moving that ball forward. And, and so in my essay, what, what I said was, if you're gonna fail, like fail big, like fail gloriously trying to do something that really matters to you, and when you fail and you deal with that um, consequence in terms of how that feels, really try to center yourself around how extraordinary you are, <laughs> that you tried it and that you, you moved the ball. And then if you've got it in you, and I hope you do, get back up and try to do it again. And let me just, I've got more questions, but I bet there's probably some Dory. So do we, are we doing live as well? Yeah. Uh, how do you combat and deal with people who have violently opposed views to you, even on like base principles, and then get to talking policy with them afterwards if their base beliefs are different? There are some people that you can't talk to. Um, I know that's not a very <laughs> constructive answer. Um, in my legislative experience, for example, I really prided myself on working across the aisle and got quite a lot a lot of legislation passed doing that. You have to do that in Texas. Um, it's a, a quite um, predominantly Republican place. But there are some areas where it's worth drawing that line, you know, where you, you can't find a way to compromise. And I think the most effective way to communicate when you're in that place, or any of these places actually, even where you do find that middle, is to do it through personal experiences and, and human stories. A lot of times we have these conversations up in the ethereal world and we're kind of stuck in our own ideological way of thinking about them. But when we can make them more real, it really makes a difference. So a great example of how that can move the ball in the conversation around LGBTQ equality that really began to move when a great deal of work was done determining how to talk about it and to talk about it in a way that was more resonant than had been the case. It had been talked about 
specifically as equality and that we all ought to care about it just to be you know, living in a full and equal world and that we all ought, ought to be treated that way. But the conversation shifted, purposefully so, to be much more personal. And a lot of work actually was done in your state around that. Door-to-door conversations with people were had where um, couples who were impacted by the inequality of marriage equality, for example, would go to a older Republican household and say, we want to talk to you about why this matters to us. It really shifted people's thinking about it. And it's because it, it became personal and because they saw it as something personal. Uh, storytelling is powerful. And, and I love seeing the fact that it's becoming more and more prominent, um, that technology has, has provided such a great platform for people to share stories and to influence based on that. A lot of abortion story sharing going on online um, post-2013 and the filibuster and kind of people's consciousness raising about that. And I think that's our most effective way to try to get through hard conversations. But that doesn't mean everyone's always going to listen. Hi, I'm Monica, and I'm so excited that you're here. I grew up in South Texas. um, And when I was growing up, Ann Richards was the governor. So I'm going to ask. Um, a question just on the topic of failure again. Um, She was the first governor I got to vote for. I went on to work in um, President Clinton's first White House. Mm -hmm. Barbara Boxer, um, um, Dianne Feinstein, all these women were were running. And I felt so invigorated as a young woman coming out of college. Mm -hmm. Um, It's a very different story now. And I look at that from when I was young and where we are now everything that Hillary Clinton's had to go through, everything that Elizabeth Warren is going through, et cetera, everything you've gone through. And thank you, by the way, for Thanks. going through that. Um, where have we failed? And what do I tell my daughter? It's such a hard question. The what do I tell my daughter is such a hard question. Um, the night of the election, I have a 34-year-old and a 28-year-old daughter. And I was at the event in Manhattan. Um, I had phone conversations with both of my daughters that evening, both of them crying their eyes out, um, and both of them asking questions from a place of what was real fear. What's going to happen? What's going to happen? I feel really optimistic right now about the what's going to happen because I am so encouraged by the personal reaction that people have had to saying, we're going to step forward and we're going to use our voices. What you tell your daughter, I hope, is to participate in that with you to the extent that you participate in it. Show her through role modeling the power that you have and how you're going to express it. And show her that you're going to sustain it. I I think that's one of the big questions right now. Are we going to sustain this enthusiasm that we have right now for our values and our desire to make sure that they're going to be heard? Um, But at that top level, once again, I think it is our very um, important responsibility to make sure that we're doing everything we can to create legislative bodies that reflect who we are as a community. Um, And that doesn't just mean making sure we have women. It means making sure we have women of color who are dramatically underrepresented in legislative bodies around this country, that we have transgender Uh, representatives, that we have people from different cultures and religions and backgrounds, both socioeconomically and otherwise, unless we're really reflected in the decision makers, we're not going to move things forward as productively and as effectively and as quickly as we'd like to see. So if you're going to spend your energy somewhere, I would say, run for office. <laughs> um, or, or you know, find a candidate that you can get behind and that you can help, not just by writing them a $5 check every week, but 
making sure that you know you go knock on some doors for them and you have some conversations about why their election makes a difference. Republicans for a long time have been very astute at building from the base up and making sure that they are putting people in places where they have the potential to climb in the political world. So the school board races and city council races, which is where I started too, um, it, it's a really important way for us to, to make an impact. I'll have to talk. Hi, my name's Mina, Hi. and um, first I just want to say thanks for coming, and also thank you because I you really personally affected me. Um, I actually did knock on doors for you in thank Texas you. as part of um, <laughs> Battleground Texas. So, um, and I I really I want to say that I feel like you revitalize politics in Texas. Um, everyone that I spoke to, we spoke to a number of people who actually said, you know, we're switching parties. Like, they were frustrated, and, mm. and I felt like you had a big part in that. Thank you. Um, and, you know, as you mentioned, we are seeing a revitalization in interest in politics and people getting involved. Um, one of my questions, or one of my question is, you also see, women voting against their own interests a lot of the time. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I feel like it is because they just mm -hmm. focus on one issue. How can we make it a larger conversation so that they actually perhaps want to start supporting mm -hmm. each other rather than tearing each other down? Mm -hmm. So, um, I like the way you ended that last question <laughs> because it made me think of something that Chelsea Handler said recently about women. <laughs> that we've been taught to tackle, not to climb. And I do think sometimes we can be each other's own worst enemy because there's a lot of judgment that goes on, right? Depending on the choices that we've made in our own lives and careers or whether that career is outside the home or inside the home. Um, this is the $20 million question though. How do we make sure that people aren't voting against their own interests? And there's a lot of education that needs to take place because people aren't going to vote against their own interests because they think they're voting against their interests. They really believe they're voting in their interests, right? Um, and I, I think Democrats have failed, myself included, in doing a good job of communicating why it is that our values are ones that really are, are more in alignment with most peoples in this country. Um, and there's a, a lot of work being done right now on how do we reframe the narrative and how do we do a better job of talking about that. But back to that personal storytelling, again, um, where we have experiences that we can share with people who may disagree with us and paint a picture of a real person and an impact that would feel more compelling to them, where you have opportunities to do that. I think that's the most powerful way to cut through that. And particularly if there's a way to paint within their own perspective what's happening to them vis-a-vis -a, -vis a person that they may have thought was actually aligned with their interests. So first of all, I agree with the optimism. Um, and I think that's just because everyone's having such a big wake up call. So mm -hmm. when I came to this country four years ago from London, I was maybe a latent feminist. I mean, I've always yeah. you know, believed in equality, et cetera, but it wasn't an issue for me. And then mm -hmm. I came to the Valley where everyone was male and everyone was working in tech and everyone was white. It, these issues kind of uh, became more important for me personally. But now it's like, it's because it's so bad with Trump, it feels like, the entire kind of middle ground of people who just didn't care anymore and didn't seem to be caring about politics have been awakened. So I actually think this might turn out to be a good thing. Mm -hmm. I like sharing the optimism. Mm -hmm. But I wanted to ask you about this um, question about personal storytelling, which I totally understand mm -hmm. um, in terms of building tolerance, right? Like if you're relating to this person, um, it's different. And it reminds me when I was 16, I was in upstate New York as an exchange student in a family that was you know, uneco, blatantly racist, all these things. And so my dad would like shout at black people out the out, out of this pickup truck, my host dad. Um, but then like Bob, who is the black guy who worked with him, like somehow didn't wasn't black, right? right. Like because yeah. he was Bob because he knew right. him. Right. So I think that's that's sort of what you're getting at, is right? Is like mm -hmm. once you once you know the person, you can no longer put them into this category of otherness. Right. 
Um, but on the flip side, with the politicians, it seems like we're moving further and further away from issues and more and more about the personality and that Trump got elected because of his personality that appeals to TV viewers. That yeah. and, and it was nothing about the issues, right? Everyone ignored all the issues. So how can we square those things? Like, how can we get, should we get politics away from personalities and more towards issues again? Or is that just impossible? I don't, I don't know if, if that's possible. But I think a lot of people, too, would tell you that they supported Donald Trump because they did believe that he was supportive of policies that were going to have a positive impact on their lives. So whether we were talking about people who'd been impacted by automation but he gave an easy target to blame, which was an immigrant workforce that had taken your job. Um, whether we're talking about people who worked in industries where environmental evolution and the protections of environmental laws had um, decreased the, the employment capacity in that particular sector and they'd been impacted by that, they heard him speaking to them about that. Um, never underestimate the misogyny that is out there and the, even if it's not something that people bring forward consciously, their own subconscious feelings about the threat that equality in the workforce means to their own livelihoods and success. He spoke powerfully to a lot of those things and people were responding to them. Um, but I love your, your example about Bob, right? Because that's the only way that we can really counter that. There was a great story in the New York Times yesterday about a Mexican gentleman who was um, detained recently, and he's probably going to be deported. And in this small Iowa town, he was so well-loved. <laughs> And everyone was saying, well, yeah, we support, you know, rounding up and deporting, but not him. Like, we, it's, I think his name is Carlos. We love Carlos, you know. And Carlos had done all these incredible things in the community, like supporting firefighters and always being the person there with the food drives and different things like that. And, you know, everyone loves him. So making it the reality come to life for people is really a way to take a step back and to, to, to look at things differently. The real challenge that we have is not that there are personalities in politics that can be persuasive, um, but that we have a media culture where people self-select the prism through which they view their news and they're going to hear things and be told things very differently depending on that self-selection, right? That, to me, is the greatest challenge that we have, is cutting through the version of things that you find on different news sources and the, um, the decisions or the opinions that you form based on, on what you hear coming from, from those filters. And we all owe a responsibility, again, to take the power away from their version and, and put the power into a, a reality version that's based on real human impact. It's hard, but we each have an, we're each an influencer, and we each have an opportunity to do it to our spheres of influence. Hi. I'm Hi. Anaïque. Um, I'm an immigrant, a woman, and a Latina, so I 100% relate to your daughter's fear about what's going on. Mm -hmm. um, and on top of that, I, um, like many others, I have sort of like the opposite concern from her is I'm raising a white male mm -hmm. in the Silicon Valley, um, and I'm deeply concerned about um, what he's gonna, going to grow up listening to um, at school and mm -hmm. on, in, on the TV and so on. Um, it was very frustrating not being able to vote last election. Um, so I, I guess my, my question to you would be, how do you think um, we that do not get to vote in this country can have the, the biggest impact um, beyond the ballots? And, um, in, in you know, a myriad of ways, and again, find the thing that feels most authentic and of value to you personally. Um, if it's in the political space, obviously supporting candidates and working for them, even if you can't vote for them. For example, in Texas, 
I had a large number of dreamers who worked really, really hard on our campaign, none of whom could actually vote for me, but all of whom had a vested stake in what the outcome of that election looked like and who cared very deeply about the direction that we were going as a state. You have a wonderful opportunity with your son, you know, to be an influencer in the way he's going to view these issues. And um, I, I'm sure he's going to grow up beautifully uh, based on who you are and what your values are and, and making sure that you pass those on to him. Um, if, you know, you find yourself really deeply passionate about um, LGBT equality or the environment or gender equality, Find an organization that matters to you and support the work that they do and ask them how you can be valuable to the work that they do. There's so much that's needed in terms of our um, time and our passion that as long as you find a place that feels meaningful to you, you will be making a difference. You really will, whether you can ultimately vote or not. And Wendy, we're going to take one more question from a man who's been watching over the live stream who asked, how do you see the role of men as allies? What can we do to help this cause? That's a really good question. Um, first of all, I'll, I'll tell you a story about myself and the word feminism, back to what was said earlier. When I was in my 30s and I was running for city council for the first time, I was asked by a reporter whether I was a feminist. And I answered the question, no. And I'm ashamed to tell you that, honestly. But I, I, I want to tell you, because I, I want us to do some self-exploration about our own attitudes and perspectives. Why did I do that? Well, I felt like it was categorizing me in this limited way and defining me in a way that other people would look at and disqualify me based on that categorization. But by doing that, I was playing a role in marginalizing women, right? Um, what I would love to see more of, and I'm so pleased to see so much of it right now, are men stepping forward and saying, I'm a feminist too, because to be a feminist really just means that you support the idea that we should all be equal in society and in the economy, right? Um, what's that bumper sticker? Feminism is the radical notion that women are human beings or something like that. <laughs> Um, I'm really encouraged about that, too, though, and where we are. The marches, the women's marches that took place around the country and around the world, there were so many men. There were so many beautiful, wonderful men stepping forward and saying, this matters to all of us. I'm with her. I'm with her, exactly. Um, and, you know, I, I think more men are, are looking at this from the prism of their mothers and their sisters and especially their daughters and wanting to create a world where they have um, the opportunity to, to fulfill their dreams and, and their um, best opportunities for themselves. And so more and more, uh, we're joining this conversation as one. And I think one of the powerful ways that we can talk about it is the fact that when we are all working toward gender equality, we're actually all working to a place where our economy has the strongest opportunity to thrive. And it really goes back to looking at what happened when women were able to really enter the workforce and stay in the full-time workforce for the first time. It was in the 1970s. And I know a lot of the really young people in this room cannot even fathom. But in, as of 1971, birth control was illegal. If you were not married, you could not have birth control. In 1972, with a Supreme Court decision that's much less known than Roe v. Wade, Eisenstadt v. Baird, birth control became legal for unmarried persons, not just married persons. There had been a Supreme Court decision a few years prior to that that, equal, that allowed uh, married people to access birth control. So birth control and then, of course, Roe v. Wade, with our right to make determinations about our own bodies, we could suddenly decide that we were going to enter the workforce and we were going to stay there if we wanted to. And the women's participation rate in the workforce took this huge climb. It went from about the low 20 percentile to the mid 40 percentile over the course of the next three decades and, and hung there. And because it hung there, 
we contributed significantly to the economic output, the economic growth of the country, about an, an estimated $1.7 trillion in 2012, which pays for, by the way, Medicaid, Medicare, and Social Security combined. Just our participation, our increased participation from the 1970s to that point is responsible for being able to pay for all of those programs. So we all have a vested stake in women's equality and women being able to realize our full economic participation in this country. And I want to hear more women and men sharing that with with their friends and their coworkers, that this isn't just a social issue. It's not just about saying we ought to treat everyone fairly and equally. We all have an economic stake in it. And it goes back to that saying that a lot of people think is just a trite little campaign saying, when women do better, we all do better. It's really true. Um, and so we, we all have not only a stake in it, but we ought to be exercising our voices and making sure that we're spreading greater understanding about that. Okay, well, thank you so much for thank coming. Thank you.